Hello, I'm Kristen Perisonotto. And I'm Hannah Ferguson, and we're co-founders of Cheek Media Co. This is the Weekly Cheek Podcast. Cool. Okay, so what I'm going to say is I'm going to stop being so fucking problematic. (laughs) And everyone, be nude if you want to (laughs) be. Just because you're a white woman doesn't mean you get to do whatever the fuck you want. Before we start the podcast, I would like to acknowledge that we are on stolen lands of the Yagra and Turrbal people. And I, again, would like to shout out the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I'm wearing the shirt today. You can see if you're watching the video. You can't actually buy these shirts anymore, but um, they did a, a collab with the Iconic. So you can buy the shirts without the voice treaty truth on the top. Um, oh, I might buy one. Are they yeah, on the Iconic? Yeah, 30 bucks at the Iconic. Oh, that's Iconic. really good. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and like they partnered. It's not like the Iconic ripping Just, them off. Yeah, that's, that was my other question. Cool. Exactly. So get on to that. Welcome back to the Weekly Cheek. Welcome. Um, I just feel like I need to acknowledge my ear. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> I don't know why I feel. Imagine like... it was just that. Look at it, beautiful. You beautiful. were just you were just drawing attention. To you. There's nothing wrong with it. One of my ears is blocked, so if my volume is a bit weird, that's why. I it's can't not. Really hear it's actually point. not weird at all. I will like because if it gets weird, I will be like, "You're being weird." Okay, thank you. But it's funny because Kristen's ear has been blocked all week, and we went to Sydney. We came back. It may be to do with the flight. It was a bit before we went even left, wasn't it? Yeah. But, the flight um, fucked it up real bad. To the point where, I, like, Kristen has very good hearing. And yesterday we were walking to an event and on the way <laughs> <laughs> I was on Kristen's bad ear side <laughs> and I said, so where is the Hilton Hotel anyway? And then she was like, anyway, I've just been thinking about it. <laughs> like, you know what's like, really annoying? And then I was like, oh. And so I, I audibly said, Oh, you didn't hear me. And then during a gap, and then Kristen just continued on her tangent about, you know what's really weird? And I was like, fucking hell. Like, you're okay. you're just a very, like, I think part of the reason I consider you a friend. <laughs> Ooh, it's a bit much, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> barely Is that you're other. very aware all the time. Like, you are, I like people who are very type A. Yes. But very similar in the way that it's like, I don't like to be... Yeah. unaware or un- just of my surroundings or who I'm speaking with or blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So it's really odd. It's disturbing. <laughs> to be walking around in the world with you where you're just like, get on this side because I got what? nothing. Like you could get <laughs> murdered and you wouldn't know about it until it's too late. That's why I keep telling people because I'm like, I'm not being rude. Like I genuinely cannot fucking hear a thing you're yeah. saying. Anyway, phew, I'm so glad that's out in the open. I mean, <laughs> I a few continue. weeks ago it was thrush. So I didn't think the ear was going to be as big of a deal. I don't know what bothers me more. I think the ear is worse. I think it's because it's near your head. Yes. On your head, some would say. On the head. So I think that like the thrush can potentially be ignored if if pain, Agree. if the itch, you know, the vibes are down. Agree. Do you but the just... ear can never be ignored. So in this episode, we are talking about the place of the white woman in feminism. And I love that we're deciding that on our podcast and our own platform as two white women are going to discuss our role. But I think that's But important. isn't that what you should be doing? I, I think that we shouldn't be putting it on other people. I exactly. think that it's unfair to uh, to start. I think a really good place to start this discussion is that last weekend, um, I know we posted about it incessantly, mm-hmm. but we went to Sydney and there was an event and all about women like festival or conference or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, at the opera house. So we went down to Sydney. I bought us tickets for Christmas as a fun thing to do. And we went to five different sessions. It was excellent. Would recommend going next year if they run it. Um, And one of the features of most sessions was that there was a Slido, which you could send questions into, and then they would ask the panelists at the end of the session. Yeah. And so what I found was we went to one of the first sessions we went to was first nations. Women look to the future. Another one we went to was after consent. We went to talk with Roxanne Gay. Um, those are three of them. And what we found was that during the sessions where women of color and first nations, women were being asked questions, what predominantly came up was like, well, what should white women be doing to yeah. like help? And it's like, what should I do as a privileged person? Kind first of off, you shouldn't be asking them to tell you. Exactly. That is like, it really hurt myself because I was a bit like, they're not with us. (laughs) They're not with us. We would never ask We would literally (laughs) never ask you. That's big pick me energy, but but in a good way. (laughs) But no, but it's like, I have a deep problem with the fact that we're in 2022 and we're hardcore feminists. And I think that we're trying, I think that, you know, 
every day I probably fail at being intersectional in some way, minor or major. There's there's probably some failing. Like I know mm-hmm. that's a long way to go, right? Yeah. But something that I think about a lot is, well, I don't ever want to put the onus or the responsibility on a woman of color or someone who's in a minority group to explain to me what I should be doing. Yeah. Like if you can't fucking open Google and ask your own questions and find the answers yourself, like I don't think people realize how much energy education takes. Yeah. Flex Mommy is a really good example of yes. someone who, who's obviously a woman of color and she calls it a out. lot of the time. Yeah. is just like, no, I'm not your search engine. No. Like I don't owe you anything. Yeah. And I think that like, I think, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people see that and they're just like, what? Like that's, oh, I feel like they maybe feel like it's a personal attack. Yeah. And I do have empathy for that. Um, however, <laughs> however, <laughs> there is so much like our audience is tiny compared to flexes. Yeah. And, and there's two of us Yeah, is one of her. I don't know. I know she was like hiring someone. Um, I think like, um, I know that she has a team in the, fa- in terms of her one of her stuff. business partner friends manages like, like her subscriptions and her email and things like that. Yeah. But I think that on her Instagram, it's mainly her. Yeah. I mean, and I really think what she does is fantastic. And I think it's because people feel often that they're being shamed if Mm. they're being told, like if someone asks a question and a lot of the questions will be like, where did you buy this item from that you're wearing Mm -hmm. or your furniture? And I can kind of, in a way, understand that more because they just want a direct answer about where it's from. But also like the thing she, I remember one distinctly, she has this like stool that's a corn cob. Mm-hmm. and someone was like where and it's like it's really not that hard to google stool corn cob because yeah. it's not like you're gonna get lost in the like you know like it's not like that that's the thing i think it's is like supply it is not that hard like how many times between you k to 12 and you need did we learn how to fucking research for just for yeah. us to turn around and put it on an influencer and especially exactly. a woman of color exactly and i think that like these are quite like very small examples but. of people asking stuff that they could find out for themselves. But it's like, how many bricks does it take to build the fucking castle, right? Yeah, like, exactly. But then, like, I think it's just a – it's the same idea, like someone asking you where you got something when they could Google it. Yeah. Um, and then that just kind of ramps up to asking, you know, people of colour, like, how can I be a good ally? How do I become more intersectional? Mm. Shall we do the scenarios? No, no please. Or is I, would, it... I would love to. Okay. So I wrote an article um, – On International Women's Day, it was posted the day after about like, it was called A Note to the White Women of Australia. And I think that, um, I mean, I obviously didn't come up with this idea, but I think that the last two IWDs, I have seen more content talking about like how, well, how IWD lacks intersectionality basically. Um, And I'm not going to go into the full history because I, I think a lot of people do already know, but it actually started as like, a working women's day. Yeah. Like it was never supposed to be, it was never celebrate women. That is not IWD. Like it used to be a day that we would take to the streets and be like, this is not fucking good enough. And we are going to be yelling about it. It's not like, yay, women. Like that's not what it was ever going to be. And that is so exclusionary of so many women. I don't think, see, Agree. I know mm-hmm. what the purpose of it is and I would know what I would prefer to be doing on IWD, which is taking you to the streets. Yeah. I don't think there's a problem with celebrating women. Well, I don't mean like specific. I don't mean like we can't celebrate women. What I mean is like the corporates grabbing hold of it Definitely. and being like, yay, I have three lovely women in my team and they are incredible and the business would be dead without them. These 75 men would not know what to do without <laughs> these three women that we pay $50,000 a year compared to, to their hundreds. Yeah. Um, so I just like, anyway, whatever. I wrote about this in two different articles. Anyways, and the thing that I was focusing on about um, in the article that was the note to the white women of Australia is that we – uh, so, first of all, I know it's really frustrating to see leaders of our country and really powerful men not doing shit for women. I know. It sucks. It makes me angry every day. But we we are better than that and we don't have to be part of that problem. But you can become part of that problem. Like, um, I think Christine Holgate is the epitome of this because, look, the stuff that happened to her, not great. No, she, no. I mean, I think you can. I think you can have it both ways. I think you can say the way that she was treated was appalling. Yeah, of course. Right. But she's fucking gets paid so much fucking money. Is that your whole argument? 
she is so. a very rich woman in a powerful position and I just don't think that a lot of young women, um, even privileged young women, but then a particularly diverse and intersectional women related to any fucking thing she was talking about when it was going through. I, I think she's the epitome of girl boss feminism. Right? Yeah. I mean, if it's feminism, it's kind of like the Julie Bishop scenario to me um, where you can pick and choose when it suits you. Exactly. I don't necessarily have a problem with her being a CEO mm-hmm. because I, I think like if we're going to start shredding people for that, like we, we should be going for men before we go for women. Oh yeah, of course. But I, I get your point. I, I get upset or not upset, but I'm just like, fuck off. When I see the video, I, I think there was a, the respect, safety, equity or the, you know, this new campaign. Yeah. Seeing Christine Holgate among these other women mm. was just like, that's not the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, again, something awful happened to you that happens to most women in the workplace in mm, a different unfortunately, sense. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, but I think the hard thing is it, it – Christine Holgate was put in that video at the expense of others who have done so much more. Yeah. And I think that we choose these rich white women like Christine Holgate – to be the poster girl for the movement when someone like Dania Money isn't included at all. Yeah, exactly. And that's what that's what tears me up inside a bit. Mm-hmm. Is like, I'm not necessarily against Christine Holgate. Me I'm, neither. I'm not her. I'm not her supporter. I'm not her audience. But I I just think that is a wasted opportunity. Yeah. To provide prominence to someone who has something more important to say. Yes. And who represents a diverse group of people. Yes. And my my problem mostly was with the way that the media reacted to her because like at the end of the day like it happened to her. She was the one in like having to face up in the Senate inquiry. Um, obviously it was going to be her. It happened to her. I'm not saying like, you should have given up your place in the inquiry. No. But like the way that the media, and I think again, like I think she's quite, she's someone who, you know, someone of our mum's age might think like, wow, but just not for us. Um, and again, yeah, not, I don't really, I don't have anything personal against her, obviously, but the way that the media was like, and then she showed up in suffragette white and she, and I'm just like, what the fuck That's is what I, going but on? Then again, it's like, it's not her suffragette fault white. How much, like how that. much was that fucking suit? But I think that's unfair because it's not her saying that. No, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's My problem way... was with the reaction to it, yes. not so much with her. Because, again, like, it happened to her and that's it. Like, we're going to talk about um, the perfect victim Suffrage in another yeah. in another episode. But I just think this, like, the reaction to something like that, it's like, yes, it happened to you. And just because you're white and rich, it doesn't mean that it was any less bad. It doesn't yeah. Exactly. But the reaction to it, I think... Um, the media was kind of like, what a moment. But I'm just like, was it a moment? <laughs> but that's what's confusing because I do think that plays into the perfect victim complex, right? Yes. Like we're going to talk about. But yeah. I think it's hard because, again, it's like I feel like I'm having a shot at her even though I'm having a shot at the people in the response. Exactly. But it's like literally what's happened here is the media have found a controversial position to take to play her as this perfect victim, suffragette, white, all this mm. shit. Um, and I think the thing is, is it's like, is it because she's palatable to the public as a feminist? Yeah, exactly. It's like Julie Bishop. Now yeah. she gets to be that person because we've decided it's okay for her to be the fucking poster girl. Yeah, and it's now. not. No, it's not. All right. So go back and, listen, and read the article. And I think that these scenarios, again, like obviously I say this all the time. I'm not saying that I'm like the greatest intersectional feminist ever to live, but I personally do think that it is actually quite easy to figure out for yourself how to be a better ally to women of color so that you don't become part of the problem. Um, And I think that the first thing, I also talked about this in the article, and I would like to highlight it because I think it is very smart, not to brag, um, about like the idea of acknowledging your privilege. Like everyone's talking about, "We we have to acknowledge our privilege. We have to acknowledge our privilege. We have to go one step further than acknowledging it. Because I think, and again, right, this in the article, acknowledging your privilege, I think, and from what I have seen, oftentimes um, just results in feeling bad and guilty and like you are embarrassed and you should pull and like you mm. should pull away from a movement. You're like, my voice can't be heard because I am a white woman. I have lots of privilege and I'm just going to like fuck off and be silent. And there are scenarios where you should do that. Yes. Well, I think there instead of, be, you don't have to be the voice, but there are other things you can do in and the movement. Exactly. And I think that a really good point was made. And I felt, oh, I've never, like, 
I wish we talked about this more was in this after consent talk that we went to, it was with Brie Lee, Amy Tunig, Saxon Mullins, and it was hosted by Lucia Osborne Cowley. And essentially they were talking about their role in the movement as educators. Um, and this is about, you know, con- changing consent laws, affirmative consent being introduced in New South Wales, uh, you know, age appropriate consent being mandated nationally in the curriculum, mm-hmm. all these sorts of things. And one of the things that Brie Lee said, which I thought this isn't talked about enough, is she said a lot of people will message activists in the space and say, like, what can I be doing? I want to start a platform. I want to do this. And it's like, I want to start an organization. Exactly. And it's like, people have been doing the work for years. They don't need a new organization. They need volunteers at the back. Yeah. And I think that, and, and, and to be honest, the thing I was thinking during that was, oh my fucking God, I started a, a media company when there's other media companies <laughs> in existence. And I was like trying to examine that. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think the point, and I think that does apply in some ways. We, I, I mean, to be honest, when we started Cheek, it's because we didn't see anyone doing this specifically in the, yeah. in the area. There mm-hmm. was a gap for us. And Educational, but fun. Maybe there's not a gap anymore. Maybe not. Just because we're here, no. Because I think because <laughs> we're so now. big and we filled it. So there is a there is a there is an argument there that yeah. you know we've just we're just taking up space. Yeah. Um. And I I agree with that. And I probably overthink it more than people I'd like to admit. Um. But the thing I think is I think that we we gravitate towards the microphone mm-hmm. literally right now. So this is ironic, and I understand <laughs> I'm being a hypocrite. But I think that when we are looking for a specific cause to campaign or advocate for, um, we want to be the shiny new toy at yeah. the front. And, it, uh, and I think one of the things that they were really excellently pointing out was you might see, you know, their follow account or them mm-hmm. speaking at, you know, national press club or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's not like that. Yeah. Like how much do you sacrifice and give up to be in those positions? And it's, you, you, sh- you don't need to be that person. You can be in a t-shirt and jeans at mm. the back, you know, making shirts, sending yeah. out flyers, cooking the meal afterwards. Like you can be doing those things and that's so worthy and important. It's not just about being at the front. Yeah, exactly. So true, Queen. All right. Scenarios. In, into the scenarios. So you're just getting into feminism. Oh, sorry. You have been a feminist for a while, but you're just starting to hear about intersectional feminism. The idea is completely new to you and you're keen to learn more. How do you go about it? Um, honestly, I'd probably try to think because there probably was a stage mm. when I started uni, I wanted to be way more engaged than I was. Like I felt like I was just an Instagram activist at the time that would share a few infographics. So I applied to volunteer, uh, with an organization that it's like a feminist project. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's how I met you. Um, I remember. Yes. But thank you. In case you didn't know, <laughs> I also think, I think there was one Christmas or birthday where I asked for like five books because I didn't, I didn't have the money at the time to pay mm-hmm. for like five books, but I wanted them. So I like asked my mum mm-hmm. and, um, just for book vouchers and things. So I could go out and buy books on intersectional feminism. Um, I listened to podcasts. I Google. I think that the key is finding what's already out there because the resourcing that's already there means that you literally should never have to ask someone in real time. Yeah. Unless it's like an issue that's emerging and you have no idea. But then again, you don't. The other thing I think is that people make and make and make and make so much content and teach so many things on so many platforms and to individually feel, and the word is entitled, to their time in a personal inbox mm-hmm. to me is like, what planet are you on? Yeah, I agree. This is not about us. Again, I'm happy to receive the messages. We're not that big of a platform. Yeah. I like what we do. I wasn't even specific. thinking about it. It's just in relation to but us. But it's like when I, if I was to message Flex Mommy, it's like she absolutely has that content out there. Yeah. I do not need her to personally go, oh, I'm just going to reply to Hannah Ferguson. Mm-hmm. That's fucking absurd. <laughs> Like she's interested in becoming more intersectional. And, I get and to be that. honest, I think this is, I think maybe three years ago, I messaged Clementine Ford a question. Okay. And she answered. Mm-hmm. And now I look back at that and I'm like, what a dumb fuck I was. How <laughs> dare I? I was asking her, I was, I think I messaged her like, thank you so much for this content, blah, 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 blah. And then she replied and was like, you know, responding to that. And then I said sort of something to the effect of how do you, like, 
how do you regulate the emotion you feel when there's so much to be angry about? Mm -hmm. I think it was obviously a personal question based on the stories at the time. Yeah. But looking back on it, I'm like, she talks about this and writes on it all the time. Like, why did I feel the need to message her that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, fuck off, Hannah. Go away. But I think it's one of those things that's like, the content exists. You're not looking. Yeah. And you want to have, I think a lot of it is you want to have a personal conversation and a personal connection with this person. Mm -hmm. And that's not fair on them because they don't know you. Yeah. Parasocial relationships are very strange and should be looked at more closely. Well, interesting. You said that because this is the final scenario. You are you, obviously you're a white woman. Um, You have a friend, person of color. You're both feminists and progressive politically and talk about it a lot. How do you remain cognizant of the added layer that race, um, you know, poses or like provides the context when having conversations about politics and social issues with your friend. How, sorry, how to remain cognizant. Yeah. Yeah. Like how, how do you go about it? I guess. Just being aware of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of times I'm probably not very aware of it. Mm -hmm. I think I'm trying to be better. I think that, I think one of the unfortunate things that a lot of white women, myself included, have done do do is that we analyze the person we're talking to to provide a safety net for what we can and can't say. Yeah. yeah. I think that some people have to, they read the room and make jokes accordingly. And I think that that's a very hyper-social, um, in a way problematic because you're measuring what you can get away with on the basis of who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. So I know that I have some problematic views, not about race, mm-hmm. not about sex, not about gender. I think I have problematic views about, I'm not going to share them. <laughs> so I was like, where idea. are you going here? But sometimes, I, but I think for you, it's more like, like we all have like things that were just like, must unpack, it's but like, it's just not done it's, yet. It's exactly like when we talk about, um, when we like put out the questions that are like, what's your anti-feminist view? Like what's the thing that you struggle with? Yeah. I think everyone has that thing. Mm. Right. And one of the things that I have is, um, like, I think one of the great things we have is, like, we don't like lingerie. Maybe that's not problematic to people, but, like, yeah. neither of us like that stuff. And it's not like I'm shaming people for it, but yeah. I we, we're not on the We're not on the page of, like, empower and, like, reclaim lingerie. Yeah. I'm as, also not – I'm not very thing. comfortable with nudity. Oh, yeah. That's not a very thing. extremely uncomfortable, I would say. Thank you um, for that. <laughs> Rose. It's a weird roast. It was I a sounded really roast. mean. Yeah, I you did. To, Good. I Keep that in. funny. Keep that in. <laughs> Fucking problematic. <laughs> Fuck. Shaming me um, for my struggles. <laughs> but sorry, back to the point. I think that when I'm, say, talking to you, you know that I have an extreme problem with nudity mm. because I tell you. You said it, yeah. And I've obviously now said it on the podcast. So I'm kind of telling a lot of people. You kind of a few episodes ago too. Yes. But what I mean is I think that in circumstances where you know someone loves nudity or is nude, I wouldn't mm. be like, I fucking hate nudity. <laughs> like you don't do that. You are constantly yeah. measuring what you can say and not say to remain likable in that scenario. Yes. right? And I think a lot of us in those scenarios will be sitting there and thinking, oh, well, I can't make this joke or say this thing or do this thing or think this thing because I'm in this group, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that also when we're around certain people, we accept a standard that we wouldn't allow for ourselves. If some man in a bar or at a party makes a joke, I don't honestly know hand over heart that I could go up to them and say that was fucked. Yeah. Because I'm not there yet. And I wish I was. And it's Mm -hmm. one of the things Roxanne Gay said was like, when we talk about what you should be doing, the first thing you should be doing is fucking fixing your racist family members. You're right. Mm -hmm. All I do is make memes about them, but I really should be ringing them to yell at them. (laughs) Well, I think more, more the point is like, don't like, you don't have to get into the comments and like go at it with some Mm. random person. No, but I, I get the point is that I do bash myself up for, for that a bit, Mm -hmm. like uh, for lacking that, strength yeah because i think again it's like very easy for me to get on this podcast and be like i'm this and i'm that and i Mm -hmm. have these views but then in the context of people that don't think like us i am scared yeah i do get scared i do get very anxious about calling people out i Mm -hmm. I struggle with it i'm not good at it and i want to be better at it but i think that this is a long-winded response to the scenario but i think that it's one of the things that i think i want to be more cognizant of is when I'm answering a question or when I'm in a specific environment, trying to apply my values in exactly the same way and not cutting up my personality pie based on who I'm with. Mm. I, I want to be better at holding the same level of accountability to everyone instead yeah. of like being lenient on a friend or letting a joke slide or this and this and this. Mm-hmm. I, I think that when we talk with 
radical people, we're much more careful yep. and we're much more measured in what we say and how we think. And I want to apply that to more scenarios because that's the person I want to be. Yeah. Ideally you would not be saying like, I'm not going to say this because that person's there. Like I think like, um, and, but sorry, I, I just want to clarify, sorry to interrupt. When I say like, it probably sounds very problematic. And I'm like, I don't make this joke. What I mean is I'm not saying I make racist jokes. Yeah, and of I, course. What I'm saying is sometimes I don't share how left wing I am. Yeah. It's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I find like um, sometimes I wonder, especially because like on this podcast, I'm like the more aggressive one. Um, I often wonder like how many people around me don't say stuff because I'm there. Yes. A lot. Because they think I'm going to pop off, which honestly, like I actually don't do because I'm kind of the same as you. Like to be quite honest, I am so much more likely to like have a go at someone I don't like in yes. the, in a scenario. We all are. Yeah. Like so much more likely. Um, I probably, I don't often call out my friends, but I do wonder how many people wouldn't say something because I'm around. And if that came back to me and if I heard that from like a third party, I'd be like, that person's canceled. <laughs> it's like, to be honest, I'd just be like, that is a huge red flag. Like the idea of people. And I actually spoke to a woman um, who is Aboriginal, light skinned. And she told me that sometimes people say racist shit about Aboriginal people to her face because she, they think she's white. God. I'm like, that is just so fucked up. And like, she handles it so well. Like she's very, I don't know how she remains so calm in these situations, but she says, oh, usually I just like tell them, oh, actually I'm Aboriginal. And like, actually like, and educates them. I'm like, wow, you are so powerful. (laughs) Like, I think I would just explode. Um, You've reached the the peak peak. of humanity. Yeah. But like, that's, you know, I just, you should never... If you have the views that you wouldn't say around certain people, then you should really examine them. That's the thing. I think that often, like a lot of people in my life follow Cheek. And I know that a lot of those people don't, like my parents follow Cheek. And I don't think they've ever voted for anyone other than the Liberal Party before. Mm -hmm. But they follow. Yeah. And they listen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's an easy example is my parents because it's probably the most um, polarizing example in a way too. But I know a lot of my friends must look at some of the shit and go, oh, that's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But they don't ever say it to me. But I know those conversations have probably happened. Yeah. Where they're just like, that's insane what she's saying. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, but I've been, I think we've all been there. Like anyone who's progressive has... Like there's been increments where you've been like, whoa, that's a bit too far. Yeah. And then like, here I am one year later being like, it's not far enough. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think that the key is to, the way I'm trying trying to frame it for myself is like, well, they're following. Yeah. And if they really didn't like it, they'd unfollow. They'd unfollow. But maybe over time it desensitizes and breaks them into that sort of thinking. Makes it seem normal. Indoctrinates. Indoctrinating. Cool. Okay. So what I'm going to say is. I'm going to stop being so fucking problematic and everyone be nude if you want to be. <laughs> well, I think like, and the point I was trying to make with the scenarios is not like, it's so easy for us to sit here and be like, this is what I would do in this situation. Obviously, like, hopefully it's obvious that that's not what we're saying. It's kind of like, this is probably a bit aspirational for us. It's like, this is what I would, if I'm, if I'm thinking right now, and like it is, I know it is hard to keep all of this stuff in your brain all the time. Not that I'm apologize, like giving Mm. anyone a a, including myself a pass um because we do need to try but it is hard to like make sure it well okay i think it is hard to consider the fact that maybe you're part of a problem i understand that's challenging very hard to admit yes particularly i think for white women because we've been told like up until a lot of people still even now but like for me personally up until a couple of years ago like you're um, you know, largely a victim of a patriarchal system. And that is correct. Um, however, there are lots of things that privileged people can do to oppress like people who have things in common with them. Like there mm. are lots of things that white women can do that oppresses women of color and like can be, you know, we're talking about race in this episode, but it can be put across like any type of intersection really um and i think that it is like just because you're a white woman doesn't mean you get to do whatever the fuck you want absolutely i also think because it made me think when you were talking about the panel scenario Mm -hmm. and how you said like oh i don't know if i would do that i think that it's there's a 
I think that to me, it's because there is now a social expectation that women in on these panels will ask those questions. Yeah. I think that's a growing movement very fast. Like yes. I think now that if you're on a panel that's all white, mm-hmm. you are like that is the definition of what we're talking about on IWD. Yeah. Right? That's like a very clear problem that's easily identifiable. Mm-hmm. I think something like what do you let go with your friends and what do yeah. you accept? It's not as heavily policed because mm. it happens in like insidious and private environments and yep. we don't know what's said. Yes. And I think that we just guilt ourselves privately. Yeah, I think exactly. it's a very private experience. I think that might be one of the key differences is like yep. what, where, what, where we're shifting and how fast. Yes. And I think, I, I mean, white guilt, I feel like is, um, I guess not really that talked about in a lot of spaces no. because I think it's something that it's again, it's like something you kind of sit with personally. Um, and I think that, I mean, honestly, I think it's quite natural to feel that way, but I just think that like we should really try to avoid that, you know, feeling any feeling of guilt over a privilege, avoid letting that allow us to retreat mm-hmm. and be like, well, I'm, just going to be invisible then. Yeah. Um, and actually just think about like, if I have money, where can I donate? If I have time, where can I volunteer? Um, I'm passionate about X issue. How can I like go and lend a hand in a way that like suits my privileges, whether that is because you um, have money, because you have time, et cetera, et cetera. Like I think that there are lots of ways to get involved with the cause without having, like we said earlier, to be the star. Like, yeah. You don't have to be the star. Um, and there are also ways that there are places where you can use your voice to elevate someone else's voice. If you didn't find us completely insufferable, come back next Wednesday for a new episode. You could also find us on Instagram at Cheek Media Co or online at cheekmedia.com.au. Yes, that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs>